Good morning. morning. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. It's great to have you here on this beautiful morning. I know we got some guests and some visitors here, and if you are a guest or a visitor, welcome. It's uh, it's an honor to worship with you. And if you would, in the back of the pew directly in front of you, there's one of these connect cards, and you can fill one of those out just to let us know who you are, and and, uh, that's that's a way for us to kind of connect with one another. So please feel free to fill that out for us. You can just throw it in the offering plate when that time comes. Now, quick question. Who among us, just raise your hand if you're not having a birthday or an anniversary today. (laughs) It'd be easier to... So, we have the 57th anniversary of Lou and Carolyn Roth, 57 years. And they both said those were consecutive years. So, uh, Tinsley Murley's having his 13th birthday on Friday. Bonnie, yep. Bonnie Blakely's having her 13th birthday today. And uh, for the 50 something year in a row, the Daces and the Martins are celebrating their anniversaries together. So that's our, that's our radio broadcast. And if I missed anybody, we'll have to catch you next year. So. got a few quick announcements before we, we get started. First of all, you might have noticed in the bulletin, I think it got top billing on the announcement side of the, of the bulletin, is um, we have this thing called Inquire, and what that is, is, is Pastor Charles and I, mostly Pastor Charles, has put together this, uh, this little time for us. Anybody who's, who's new or a guest or a visitor, it's time for us to get together at 8.15 uh, before this worship service starts next week in Cox Hall. And it's just, uh, if you're new to us, and it's not necessarily about joining the church as much as it is ways you can participate in the life of our church. And you can tell by this long list of bullet or, uh, announcements I have, there is a lot, of, lot going on here in this church family in a lot of ways you can, you can get involved and participate. And obviously, it's, it, membership is... is awesome, but there's a lot of folks who, who, without even becoming members yet, um, get involved in the life of our church and participate in in the work we do here, So, and you're more than welcome to do so. So this is just a time for for those who are are new to us to to join us in Cox Hall, which is just across the parking lot, downstairs in our conference room at 8.15 next week, Um, and just be a 15, 20-minute introduction to, to who we are and what we're all about here. So that's, that's next week. Um, I, I'm just going to go through this list really quick. Um, next Sunday or next Saturday, we have our end of summer bash, something we've done every year, I think, since I've been here, except for the COVID year. And it's just a, a way to, right before school starts, a way to, to close out the summer and get ready for the transition into, into the fall and the beginning of the school year. And that's next Saturday, South Campus. Um, from 4.30 to, to 7.30, and there's cornhole and stuff for the kids and, and, uh, and all kinds of stuff, and it's just a, a picnic. It's the time for us to all get together as one church family. Um, also, next week, next Sunday, at both services, south and here, um, we'll have the blessing of the backpacks, and there's information um, specifically about that back on the welcome desk, so if that applies to you, um, and you can also call, call Paige at the church office, and she'll, she'll fill you in on that as well. Um, we've got two um, school supply drives going on. One is, has to do with our South Connects. Um, South Connects is our relationship with South Elementary School, directly across the street from South Campus. So we have really two schools in the school district that we, that we partner with, the junior high and South Elementary. And this particular one is for, for uh, South Elementary. And there's a list, there's a bulletin insert that's got all the different things that are, are needed. And the, what those school supplies do is they go to the teachers. 
to help supplement those kids who may not have been able to afford or, or missed out on some of the school supplies they need. So we're supplying the teachers so the teachers can supply their kids, and that's what that's about. And we also have a school drive for Festival of Sharing, and there's another box that the United um, Women of Faith are, are doing, and that box is, is back there, and you can read about that in your, in your bulletin. So that's the school part. Um, on the 24th of August, we've got a blood drive, and it's in memory of Caitlin Burris. Caitlin is uh, Crystal Goodwin's daughter who, who died a couple months ago of leukemia, a, a blood cancer. So we're having a, a blood drive in, in memory of Caitlin. That's on Thursday the 24th, and it's from uh, 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Anytime in there is available. And there's a flyer back in the back. Um, you can grab one of those, and it's got a, a website. You can go on there and, and sign up for your time. If you have any questions about that, you can call the church office or, or give Crystal a call. Now, did you notice on the, the pre-service slides uh, that Fellowship Hall looks like um, a war zone? Uh, we started construction last week, or more specifically, we started destruction last week. Um, the wall, that, that serving wall, you know, between the kitchen and Fellowship Hall, it took them about 20 minutes to make that go away last Monday morning, literally. Um, and they've, they, they've abated the floor, they've taken up the flooring, and so they had to cordon the whole place off because it had asbestos in it. So there's a special crew that comes in and takes care of that. So the floor's up. And so they've pretty much got it all taken apart. Now they've got to put it back together. So, so that'll be going on in the weeks ahead. And needless to say, Fellowship Hall is pretty much off limits. So um, Also going on in terms of our move construction, South Campus, probably by the next weekend, um, that gravel part of the parking lot will be no longer gravel. It'll be, it'll be paved. So we'll get that, get that done as well. Seems like we've been waiting for all this stuff to get back underway for months, and now all of a sudden it's just happening just faster than we can keep up with. So I think that's all I have in terms of announcements. Um, this could be a special service. Um, try to hold your applause, but I won't be preaching this morning. But I've got a, uh, a three-hour sermon I'm working up for next week, so I'll, I'll make up for it. <laughs> so be sure and join me for that. I'm preaching on Paul's letter to the parentheses next week. So. <laughs> but we have a special, we've got the, our, our missionaries who went to Texas um, a couple weeks ago, and they're going to they're gonna talk about their, their trip down there and and the, the transformative experience that that was. So I, I can't wait for you to hear. I got to hear it last night, and it's, it's amazing. So that, that will be our, the sermon part of our worship service. So that's all I have for announcements. So let's get our service started. Pastor Jimmy, would you pray for us? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather today to give you thanks and praise for the gift of life and for the privilege that's ours to gather and worship you. We invoke your blessings of guidance upon all we do in the name of our Lord. For we ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen. Let's turn in our hymnals now to hymn number 64 and stand as we sing.
Hello, guys. So, I am, I don't know if you all have met Mr. Brandon, my husband, Parker and Emma's dad, but I'm gonna share a little story with permission about him when he first moved to Jackson. When he was 10, they moved from, you're good, come on. They moved from a town down south called Carothersville. And I don't know if you all know this about down south, but people talk with a little bit of an accent. And so if you've ever talked to Mr. Brandon or his sister, Miss Paige, or his mom, Miss Penny, they have a little bit of an accent. And they don't say, you guys, they say, y'all, <laughs> right? So Brandon moved, and right off the bat, he said, you know, he was at a new school with new people and new teachers in a new town, and the kids, made fun of him. They said he talked funny. And he felt like a stranger. And you're going to hear in the scripture we're going to hear next, you're going to hear the word stranger. And you're going to hear about how whatever we do and however we treat strangers or foreigners, it's like we're doing that to Jesus. And so you see, Brandon right away had this really, really nice fourth grade teacher named Miss Smith. And she was really awesome. And she welcomed him. And then gradually, one by one, he started finding things in common with other kids. And they started treating him really kindly. And he made really good friends that he still has today. And Mr. Brandon's old, so that's like a long <laughs> friendship. And, and what happened was those people that treated a stranger, Brandon, with kindness, they were doing that to Jesus. And you'll hear that in the scripture today. And what I want you all to remember is whenever you're faced with either feeling like a stranger yourself or seeing somebody new, you know, we're getting ready to start school, so there'll, there'll be new people in your classes, and you have no idea how they feel, or, or why they're talking the way they're talking, or dressed the way they're dressed, but um, you're going to hear about it, the mission trip, and our experiences down in Texas with people who were coming, they were strangers to the country. And you're going to hear about how we got the opportunity to treat each one of them like Jesus. And so I want you to remember that as you go to school and you encounter people, that whatever you do, however you care for them, it's like you're doing that to and for God. And I know you guys will do that really, really well. Will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God. Thank you for strangers. Help us treat them like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, and now what I have for you today is not candy, so please don't eat it. But it's a little squishy guy called a mochi. And one thing, yes, and one thing that I have found, can you pass those around? Thank you. One thing that I have found is that everybody, young, old, whatever language you speak, it doesn't matter. Everybody loves these. And so I want you to play with your little squishy guy and remember to treat everybody like Jesus. Okay, thank you. Have a great week. Thank you, Sarah. Today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, 
and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Riley. Now, Sarah, you start them out. Okay, so we're talking about our mission trip um, to far Texas, and it was very, very far. Um, and I've been on several mission trips, uh, both as a teenager. Um, with my youth group growing up and as an adult leader. And I can say that I have never before felt like the hands and feet of God like I did with our week in Texas. Um, but it did not start out that way. <laughs> so our very first assignment, mine and Anna's, was to work in the 
warehouse for the Catholic Charities Welcome Center. And you're going to hear a lot about the Catholic Charities Welcome Center because uh, that's a pretty big part of the, the service down on the border. But we walked in, and I can't speak for Anna, but I thought, oh, this is going to be a wasted day. <laughs> I mean, it was just this huge room of piles of clothes in totes, like sort of sorted, but not really, and jam-packed racks of coats and jackets in Texas. And it was just completely not what I expected at all. It looked like a defunct dry cleaner's storage room or something. <laughs> and so there was one volunteer in there. You know, we're looking around like, oh, who's going to train us? No, there's no training. There was one volunteer. And she said, here's what we need to do. And so we got busy. We folded and sorted and organized and went through all these clothes. And she did explain to us that the process was that these asylum seekers, when they cross the border, the first place they go to after they get like, checked in is this welcome center. And they go through a registration process. And in that registration process, they get contact with their US sponsor, and they make arrangements to travel to that sponsor, usually within 24 or 48 hours. So then they fill out this form with clothes and what size clothes they need for themselves and their family because this, is the, this will be the first change of clothes they will have in weeks and sometimes months because these people, asylum seekers, most of them left with the clothes on their backs at night in secrecy because an asylum seeker, by definition, is escaping what's called a credible fear. And so they took their families and were trying to get to safety. And they had nothing with them. And so we're filling these forms. And some of the forms say, like, oh, this person's leaving at 11 AM. And it's like 10 o'clock. And we're, you know, OK, woo. So that added a little bit of urgency to it. And some of the donations of clothes were obviously pretty thoughtful and functional. Some of them looked like somebody cleaned out Great Aunt Hilda's attic and like <laughs> dumped it. And I was struck by something that my mom used to say growing up when we were cleaning out closets or whatever. And um, you know, I just wanted to get rid of something and I was just putting it in the pile and if it were stained or ripped or something. And she would say, now Sarah, if you wouldn't give this to Jesus, would you give this to these people? <laughs> OK, Mom. So I started to think about that. And then there it is, that verse again. I was naked, and you clothed me. OK. So it still felt a lot like getting ready for a yard sale, um, more than doing the Lord's work. But then we went back over to help with lunch at Catholic Charities. And we started to see the clothes that we had just folded and just sorted and just tried to figure out. We started to see them on these people. Yeah, so I have a story about that on how I was sorting clothes. So I had an option to stay there and work the pharmacy or I could go to the warehouse and sort clothes with Sarah. Well, I didn't know Spanish, and Spanish was a huge thing. <laughs> and I, I mean, I took two years of Spanish, but you know, that was a long time ago. So <laughs> I went and I went to the warehouse and I saw all these clothes, and it was just the three of us. And I was like, how are we gonna get this done? So Sarah and I started sorting clothes, and then that, there was a girl there that was forming, or doing the forms and putting them in bags. And I was sorting, and I found this shirt. And it was very, unique. It was very old, old fashioned. I mean, I'm just like, and I remember showing Sarah the shirt and I was like, look at this. I'm like, I haven't ever seen a shirt like this. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and so I put it on top in the right toe. Yep. Yeah, and I just went on my day 
and I guess the girl that was putting the forms, doing the forms, she put it in a bag. And then I went back to do the pharmacy, or tried my best to do the pharmacy, and um, I saw a girl wearing that shirt. And it made me realize, wow, they really do need clothes. I mean, they are grateful for whatever they get. And so it was great. And Anna even said, oh my goodness, that shirt looks so pretty on her. <laughs> and it was really so wonderful. And so it was like, okay, God, we get it. And, and that set the tone for the rest of the week because this is the first time these people felt safe for a long, long, long time. And we were able to be a part of that. And as we go along and everybody shares their story, you're going to hear a different piece of that verse. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. You're going to get to hear that we got to be that. We got to be that and treat each of these people um, like Jesus. And Marissa and Madeline are next. So I worked at the Respite Center as well, in the Catholic Charities, and I'm going to talk about the lunch service. So when we were gathered and, and brought into that lunch room, I just had to pause for a second in shock because it was just mass chaos in that room. I mean, it's about the size of the Civic Center, if you know, for scale. And um, I mean, there's just so many people everywhere. They were bringing in extra tables for all the people and it was very loud. And later I had learned that we served about 700 people that day for lunch. And um, there was one staff lady who was prepping this giant pot of soup for everybody to have. And she didn't speak much English. And then there was another volunteer lady that was there to help. And with both of them, we were able to come up with a nice quick system to help get the food out quickly to everyone. And um, my job was to take the serving trays and hand the bowls of soup to all the people. Um, but I did have really good help. Um, I met these two people from Colombia at the center that wanted to help us serve lunch. Um, they were so kind and they were helpful and they were young and probably about my age or maybe even younger. And they were here alone. And these two people, they weren't volunteers like we were. They were refugees that had tra traveled from Colombia to the respite center to seek asylum here in the US. And they could have sat down at one of the tables. They could have, we could have served them, but instead they chose to help us to serve them, to serve the others instead. And through these people, I saw how God calls us to serve the others as if we are serving him. And so as we put down these bowls in front of each person, it was almost as if you could see the relief in their eyes because they were just so weary and worn down and something as simple as putting this little styrofoam bowl of soup in front of them to eat just filled them with such relief and gratitude that they were able to have this meal. And this whole lunchtime is quite overwhelming with everything going on and I feel that God gave me this courage as I spoke to all these people not in English and Spanish and Spanglish. <laughs> and, and despite the language barrier, despite the chaos that was going on through the entire building, and God strengthened me to serve these people with an open and kind heart, which I pray that he continues in strengthening me to serve more of his wonderful people. <laughs> so I had border missions, which was this big facility where food gets donated from factories, and they come in on pallets and pallets, you know, fresh produce that doesn't sell, but it's still very, very usable. Like, there's nothing wrong with any of this food, it just doesn't sell. And at Border Missions, they bag the food up and they give it out every Thursday. They feed about 1,000 to 1,500 people, they come in on vehicles, they walk, they have like little buggies with like buggy parking because there's just so many people that come. And with that, they started this to help feed their community, but to also have a church service. So they give out bags of food to people, then they have worship to spread the word. And 
there, they said only like maybe five people get paid at Board of Missions, but I would say there was probably 30 volunteers plus that are there every single day. They expect absolutely nothing back. They are just excited to help their community and to know that people are getting fed every single week. And those women there and the men that were helping, they just were so happy. Like, they're just there to have fun and pack food, and they loved it. They've been there for years. And like one woman, we celebrated her birthday, and we had cake, and everybody was just so happy. Like, I just, it was kind of like feeding my starving children to hear them that. And I just couldn't believe how excited these people were to help, and we didn't speak the same language. Thankfully, just one person spoke English, but we were able to communicate and have fun and laugh, and it was an awesome, awesome time to see God work in these women and men who are there every day expecting absolutely nothing back. And it, just, it was just really cool to see. Okay, so whenever I was down in Texas, I got to work with one of the people's families. So the Board of Admissions families, they bought a run down building that hadn't been used in years and they were turning it into a church. So Dave Freeman taught me and my friend Kate how to hang drywall. So we spent the whole day in this hot church just hanging drywall. But it was such a cool experience because um, now I know that even though I probably won't get to see the church again, it's going to be used to worship one day, and it'll be a fully functioning church. I'm going to talk about the respite center that Melissa kind of showed you in a, a vision of, say, the civic center and how big it is and all those big windows that you see, kind of like an airport. So just imagine that, but the windows are all blacked out. They're just completely blacked out, so you can't really see the light shining in fluorescent lights and all that. So it's pretty dim and kind of sad in there. And the people are just kind of laying around and they um, have these little green blankets and you can tell they're just overwhelmed. They're sad. They're just completely exhausted. But, you know, I mean, it could be a story of sadness and despair, but it's not. It's a story of hope, you guys. They have hope because they're there. They want something different for their life. They want something different for their kids. So now, the parents might have been sad and, and overwhelmed, but man, those kids, <laughs> they were not. <laughs> they were definitely full of joy and curiosity. They sat and made necklaces and bracelets and they colored. And they were fun, you know, they were just like any other kids. I mean, yeah, they couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Spanish, but they were there coloring with me, making airplanes and, and doing the fun stuff. So, you know, I saw God there with the kids. And I, I'm not as good as Sarah, I have to look at notes because I mean, this is just, you know, kind of just overwhelmed anyway. You know how that is. But anyway, um, just in your mind, just to see all that. And for me, this is my second mission trip, and I just, I felt the need to come up here and speak, because it's important. These people are important. Okay, well, we're up here to talk about Catholic Charities again. Um, we were going to talk about the pharmacy, but first I just want to talk about something that's been on my heart ever since. And it's these people. If you've never been on a mission trip, it is nonstop intense together time. And you, you literally can't get away. Like, but it, it sounds like it would be bad. I miss these people every day. Like every minute, every time one of them walked into a room, my face lights up like my kid just got here. Like we laughed and we cried and we worshiped at midnight because that's when we had time to do our devotionals. We didn't have time earlier in the day. And that time together, bonded us in a way that you can't understand. We were in the most uncomfortable living situation. Like, it was not good. 
We shared three awful showers between 16 girls who couldn't shower at the same time. Like, like it was intense and it was uncomfortable and it was hard and we loved every minute. Those tomato pictures are because a pallet of tomatoes fell over and smushed and some were rotten and we were covered in it and we loved every second of that. Like we never got upset. We were never mad. We never wished we weren't doing what we were doing. We loved it and you can't understand that until you're in it. But I'm actually here to talk about the pharmacy. <laughs> um, the pharmacy was my happy place. Obviously that's where I like to be, but it was so different. It was doing, you know, talking to someone who I can at least understand a little bit, but chaos and them coming to me, but they weren't mad. They weren't even mad if I had to say, no, I have nothing to help you. They were still grateful that I tried. These people would come in and we would, you know, go back and forth. And when we had finally figured out, like we were out of cough medicine, there's limited supplies. We didn't have what we needed. So we had to get creative and try to figure stuff out. These kids that would come up would ask for sweets. You know what they wanted? A cough drop. They were so excited because that was candy. Like mom would come and get three cough drops for her three children and that would quiet them for half an hour. Like you just had to use your resources to do something completely different. Giving somebody a cup of shampoo should not be such a beautiful thing. Like not a bottle of shampoo, a cup of shampoo, enough to go take one shower and shoelaces, things that we were running low on that you're like, no, I can only, you know, you, they only wanted the one pair for themselves. They weren't out for anything else. Baby bottles, every baby should have a bottle. But they were so grateful, not for the formula that we had, but the, the days when we had a bottle to put it in, because one day we didn't. They had to go to the kitchen and get a cup, and then we could put the formula in a cup, and then the next day they got a new shipment of baby bottles. And those parents could just feed their baby like normal. But they weren't mad, they weren't upset, they were grateful, and they treated us, a stranger, so beautifully, whether we got it right or not. So they weren't the only strangers there. We were also strangers in their world, and they just worked with us like we weren't. They treated us like Jesus as much as we did them, and it was so wonderful. At one point, we had my group of kids, who were amazing, who are not kids, um, were working, and this guy came up, and he wanted to learn English from them. So they laughed, and they pronounced things wrong, and he did the same. He, they would teach him how to say something, so he would learn how to say toothbrush. And it was just a back and forth. It wasn't uneven ground. We weren't always helping them. Like, they were helping us try to figure things out. And so I feel like the way they treated us was even greater than the way we treated them. That was our job that day. But it wasn't their job to treat us like that, and they still did. I was also at Catholic Ministries, but I was there a different day. I worked in the warehouse in the morning, and then I switched to the pharmacy for the rest of the day. Um, and I saw the same thing. The, the parents were always grateful to get, like, little baby bottles or baby formula or cough medicine and stuff like that. Um, but this stuff, the stuff that we were gathering, um, running around trying to like trying to find what they needed and um, trying to figure out what they wanted in the first place. Like we were playing charades the whole time, <laughs> trying to figure out what they were saying. And it was, it was hard. It was hard to see people so desperate for things that I don't even think about needing. Like shoelaces. The, all, all the shoes I buy come with shoelaces and they, like people at the border of Mexico don't take them away from me but they did from them. And like baby formula, like my mom was saying, like we, we go out to the store and we buy it and we're independent. We don't need to ask for someone for baby formula, but we had to, they had to ask us for like the tiniest amount of baby formula, like two scoops in the small baby bottle. And it, it was just, it was hard. And at one point, I got this uh, mother and little child she had on her hip, and they had um, uh, 
clothes that were covered in what I assumed to be blood, just like almost scratched across their clothing. And I don't know where they came from to get that on their clothes. But at the pharmacy, we're not supposed to give clothes away. We're not supposed to, to um, give these people clothes unless they're exchanging them. But I could not, I could not deny these people clothes when they so desperately needed to be clean. These people, they, they need these things so badly that I don't have to think about having in my house, like we just have stockpiles in our house of deodorant or toothpaste or toothbrushes. We don't have to think about those things. But that was probably the first pair of clothes that they had had in months. We don't have to ha think about asking for shampoo and conditioner. A lot of people didn't even want conditioner. They just wanted shampoo, which I thought was crazy. Like, <laughs> I, take, I take care of my luscious locks. Um, <laughs> And, like, they just wanted all of these such simple things. And they were always so kind about it. They never once got mad at me or frustrated with me. They were always just grateful that I was trying. And I thought that that was them showing Jesus to me as much as we showed Jesus to them. That was incredible. I will not talk about the Catholic Charities because I was not having a good day that day. <laughs> but God did show me something very, um, very uh, profound um, while I was recovering. Um, we had Dr. Uh, Mark Lundgren and his son Grove were on the trip as well, and they were working the pharmacy. Neither one of them spoke any Spanish. And from the table where I was um, sorting diapers, um, I watched those two work together, and it was so, well, it was overwhelming to see, but it was, it was awesome, too. Like I said, neither one of them spoke Spanish, and um, Mark had uh, come to me a couple of times, you know, wanted Grove to go on this trip so he could develop some social skills and make some friends, which, you know, everybody wants that for their kids. And um, what I saw was Groden brought what he had to the table that day which was an ability to look people in the eye and listen um, with respect and kindness and just like he was talking to anybody else. And it was an amazing use of what he had, which was not Spanish, but the ability to use his phone. Uh, and he would speak to the person through his phone in English, like he was talking to them without the, the phone, and hear what they had to say, and they would read it and speak back, and it was just like having a conversation and knowing uh, that that was Mark's concern that he would you know develop these social skills. It was really awesome to see him like thriving in that offering, offering to these people and to God what he had to give. Uh, and it was also um, really fun watching Mark, who spoke no Spanish, um, helping people get the medicine that they needed. And I'll tell you that in any language, um, someone can tell you if they're throwing up or if they've got a. <laughs> and Mark, Mark, uh, Mark definitely mastered that uh, that charade. Um, but it was just so eye-opening to see that God can use any one of us, no matter what we, skills we have or don't have. If we're willing to offer what we do, whether it's little or big, um, he can use that to help us serve people and share his love with all those around us. And then the other thing that was um, very eye-opening to me was on our first, uh, well, when we first arrived at our border perspective site, we went right into our orientation, and we were kind of smacked around or <laughs> with um, a lot of statistics that were hard to hear and information that we didn't really, we never heard that before. That's not what we hear on the news, and um, man, we were kind of uncomfortable and challenged, and then that was our, just our orientation. And then all day on Monday, we spent in kind of this learning uh, and tourist kind of mode, where we spent the morning with the Border Patrol agents, where we, again, heard hard to hear statistics, things that we had a hard time believing that were actually true because of the things that we hear every day. 
Um, and then, so we kind of went away being challenged from that. And then we went on from there to the border wall where we took a very hot um, walk uh, to the wall. And then we walked a pretty good, what would you say, mile, mile um, of different portions of the wall. And that again was overwhelming, not what you expected, not what you saw on the news, not what um, we thought we were gonna run into. And then throughout the day, we visited historic sites. And then we also heard about the story the journey that the, the founders of Border Perspective took, a nine day journey across the entire border, and they shared with us the stories they heard from local people one on one, their story of um, service at the border, and their stories of um, challenges and the complexity of the situation. And so we had this whole day learning. We also visited, um, I think you'll see a picture of it, um, Jackson Ranch Historic Methodist Church that was actually founded about the same time as Old McHenry, and they had a um, historic, very crucial role in um, the Underground Railroad, so they were part of the, the Southern route there, so it was kind of that neat connection of having that Methodist history, and that church was actually on the other side of the wall in what they call No Man's Land, so we, we left Monday without having helped anybody, and we were kind of a little fired up. I know Dave Freeman was fired up after Monday. Um, just with like this truth that um, we were seeing things for the first time and we were kind of being challenged in some of our views and the way that we had been um, kind of educated by Fox and CNN and all those things. And then on Tuesday, our first day of service and Wednesday and Thursday, our days of service, all of that went away because we were standing in front of a person who needed food, who hadn't been fed. And we were standing in front of people who'd been wearing clothes, the same clothes for months. And we were standing in front of a woman holding a baby that had a rash. And we were able to just cry the door was open for you. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter if they came from Colombia or Mexico they were legal or illegal or had paperwork, they needed help. And all of that kind of flipped on its head for us too because we'd been challenged so much on, on Sunday and Monday. And it was um, a, kind of a quote in our book that I think, we had these devotional books that we went through and I think it was just the greatest way to end our devotional time. It says, the righteous who truly want to love like Jesus don't need to check socioeconomic background or country of origin or any other qualifier before doing unto the least of these. And I feel like that summed up our entire trip. Um, we learned a lot and we were able to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a way that some of us may never get to do again. Hopefully that we do um, because I I know that we are a church that does just that. Um, we are all the time putting away um, things that cause disunity and we're putting aside our views and we are already doing this. We are serving uh, no matter what. And I'm proud to be a part of that church. Thank you all for supporting us financially in this trip. Um, I think all of us would say thank you Nick and your, your church. Um, we definitely are looking forward to partnering with you and doing something like this again. Well, that's just our church just being church. That's really what it's all about. And, and I want to, Dave Freeman, who was, was on the trip as well, as, as was mentioned, he can't be here. He's traveling for business for the next uh, couple weeks, I think. But I knew they went on the mission trip, and, and I feel kind of silly because while they were down there saving the world in Texas, Brendan and I were in the upper peninsula of Michigan on vacation. That's uh, <laughs> the other side. But we were there in spirit. And, it was a risky mission trip, but good ministry takes is risky. As the pastor and the one, I would have much rather they'd gone and hung drywall or fixed a roof of some old lady's house who'd been a flood victim up in Iowa. But no, they wanted to go to the border of Mexico and Texas. Okay. So that's where they went. And Dave Freeman 
went down there and I talked to him one time during the week. It was on trustee stuff and I had to call him. He was down in Texas. I said, well, how's it going? He said, and he just got quiet, which doesn't happen very often with Dave. And he's like, I don't even know what to tell you. I got to process this. And he just kind of hung up. <laughs> but when he got back, we had a council meeting, like the first Monday they were back. And Dave's a trustee, he was at the council meeting. And we, I don't know, it was about 8 o'clock, 8.15 or so, and I was tired and hungry and ready to go home. And Dave looks at me and Todd Rushing and said, hey, can you guys stick around for a minute? I want to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, sure. Love to, <laughs> love to stick around. I haven't been home since 6 that morning, but oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. So, but Dave kind of went through his testimony with us, and he said, look, he said, I'm going to go back there, whether the church goes back or not. And then he kind of went through the story. And part of what he said was, he's a pretty conservative guy. He said, no matter what you see on the news, I don't care what news channel you watch, it's not true. It's just not true. And the channel I watch, I remember seeing these throngs of people, these faceless, nameless people coming across the border. And at that moment when he said that, it, it occurred to me that God knows the name of every one of those people. That we look on a news channel... And we just see this big horde crossing our border and invading our space. God knows each and every one of their names. He's counted every hair on their head. And regardless of what we think about border policy and all of our politics, it doesn't really matter because those are children of God who need us. Now, we've had this mission with Haiti for as long as, as I've, I've been here. I think it's been five years, I think, Coach told me last night, that since we've been able to physically go to Haiti, and we've had a relationship with this praying pelican down there, this, this organization, not, this, not a pelican specifically, <laughs> but, but an organization called Praying Pelican, and Tim Winborn and others had kind of established this relationship, and they were kind of our travel agent, and they set up, made it available for us to go down there and be safe and have an itinerary and work with the, the set people that we have a relationship with. We can't do that anymore. State Department won't let us do that anymore because of the situation in Haiti. We still support them. We still have a financial relationship with them, but we can't physically go there. And ministry is it's not just about writing checks. I mean, that helps. But it's more about relationships. So what I challenge the church and what I want to lead it into, and I've, I'll work with the church council on this, I want us to establish a relationship with his Catholic charities and with the border perspective and, and whomever else you all advise me on, and get that relationship going so that not just our youth in the summertime, but we can have adults as part of our GO team go down and create a relationship with this, this church down there and be a part and work with Catholic charities and let that be our new mission. And we don't need a passport. We don't got to go the, to, the, to the public health department and get 87 shots in order to go this is our country. This is our border. And this is our opportunity. Now that we've seen it, now that we've experienced it, now we're responsible for it. We're responsible to it. And so my prayer is that we as a church will add this onto our stack of things to do, and we'll tackle this. We've already tackled the addiction problem in this country. Now we're going to attack the border problem. <laughs> and we're going to do it all from Jackson, Missouri. With God's help. All right? Why not? All right, thank you all very much. And let's, uh, in response to God's great word, let's stand and sing our, our hymn of response, which I think is Here I Am, Lord. So we're going to sing the first and fourth verse.
You may be seated, and if the ushers will come forward, let's prepare to give back to God some of our first and our best with our gifts, tithes, and offerings as we, the second Sunday singers, sing. Huh? Oh, yes. Yeah. As soon as Linda gets there. Take your time. Father God, you are the giver of every good gift. We ask that you accept these gifts. We return them to you. And Lord, we ask that you multiply and magnify them so that they may be light and love in someone else's life. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> what a message. You've done it unto the least of these, my children. You've done it unto me. This is the gospel at work. Thank you, guys, for what you did. Your witness is tremendous, and it even makes me want to go. <laughs> and it has to be pretty good to do that. <laughs> now, while we're here enjoying one another and enjoying the message that's been shared, there are those among us who are going through difficult times that only prayer can help. One in our midst is Julie Combs. Many of you have heard probably about what's happened to Julie. Julie was in an accident, been miserably hurt, 
Hopefully she'll get over it. We don't know. But as requested the prayers of all of us. I think most of you know who I'm talking about. Just two Sundays ago, she requested prayer for and remembering of her husband, Richard, who passed away two years ago. Uh, she was walking in the neighborhood, got hit by a vehicle, ribs broken, lung fractured, backbone injured, really, really hurt. So please remember Julie in your prayers along with that. We want to remember Terry Ladrider in our prayers. Terry is, is Rodney's brother. He's going to have a kidney transplant. Along with that, there's many others on our prayer list that you've had time to look for. Christian Center, the Dace's friends. Along with that, Brian Meyer. And many others are on that list, so we need to remember in our prayers. So while we're here giving thanks to God for the privilege of service, part of our responsibility is serving one another in our prayers. So let us remember these needs as we pray and give thanks for the privilege that is ours to live in a land where we can do this, where we can share one another's needs, and where we realize we are indeed our sister and our brother's keeper. And as long as we've done it under the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Just remember that. Every deed we share, we're remembering our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, it's because of your mercy we gather here today. It's because of your love for us that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And we cannot even begin to give honor and praise to your name for all the blessings you share upon us. We take for granted so much, Lord, forgive us. We have so much. We throw away more than many of our sisters and our brothers in the world have to live on. Lord, help us to be the people we're called to be. Help us to be aware that we are indeed our sister and our brother's keeper. And even to give a drink of water in your name is to serve you. So challenge us as never been challenged before to do those things which we're called to do and to be and realizing that individuals are saved one person at a time. Just helping this young mother give her baby a bottle is saving one person. We can't help but be tearful in our hearts to know that there's so many of your children around the world are going through so much, and we have so much to offer. Lord, give us strength to do those things which we're called to do, and help us to lift our hearts together and realize that it's from you that receive every good and every perfect gift. To you be honor and glory now and forever in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand together and sing hymn number 431, Let There Be Peace on Earth.
starts right here inside, each one of us. Now, as we leave here today, we leave knowing we're the people of God. And there's nothing impossible in the sight of God if we trust him. So we go as a trusting people, as a people willing to serve him. And remember, as much as you've done it unto the least of these my children, you've done it unto me. Go in peace, and may the blessing of the Lord be your strength and guide today and always. And all of God's children together said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you. Not.